everybody. I'm Dr. Sujaya Banerjee, and I'm the CEO of Capstone People Consulting and the founder of the LNOD Roundtable, now called Your Commune. So welcome to uh, the Ideas Project and, and one more delightful conversation with this time with an industry veteran and now an author of a book. And I'm really excited to be able to invite today uh, Chandrasekhar Sripada, Dr. Chandrasekhar Sripada. I, I don't know whether he really requires an introduction. He's so extremely well-known and renowned. Uh, now um, faculty at the Indian School of Business, um, Hyderabad. And, um, you know, I couldn't think of anyone better than him uh, being part of academia. I think he's a real boon uh, to the people who do come in into his class. Um, Dr. Chandrasekhar has always set very high standards uh, for thinking, for reading, for articulating. And there can't be anything more delightful than having him being presented on our show today uh, as the author of the book, Shaping the Future of Work, Building Flexible Work Options and Unleashing the Human Capital of Bharat. What an interesting title. And I'm excited and delighted to present to all of you Dr. Chandrasekhar Sripada. Thank you, Dr. Sujaya. Very nice. Hi. We have known each other for a while, and I, I have equally high regard for you and the work you do. So it's a pleasure to join yes. you in the new found you commune. I look forward to being more often with you. And uh, yeah, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chanda, for joining us today. Um, so, you know, delightful, uh, really, to know of your endeavor as an author and the book that you're really out with. And I'm uh, you know, I'm, this is absolutely a timely theme and a very a timely book. Um, so to begin with, I want to um, let our viewers know uh, that this is a huge opportunity to be able to know more about the book, purchase the book and use the book uh, to be able to expand their horizons around the future of work and the opportunity of India. But I'm going to start at the start by asking you what got you to write the book? What really what were the triggers or I'm sure you were thinking about this for a while. And so how did the idea of the book shape up for you? And how did you take this leap to become an author? Mm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. And now in retrospect, I think I have some, I'm able to put together a story for it. But you know, when it happens, you don't know how it happens. Yeah. But yeah. looking back, I think there was always a writer in me. There was always probably struggling with and grappling with this. What do I have to say? What is mm. that powerful point? What is that compelling idea? What is that I need to really express? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I think two things happened which precipitated and got some crystal clear of that. Yeah. I think one thing that happened is the pandemic. That is actually possible to work from home at a scale. Mm. Yeah. Not, I alone realized it. 100,000 million people realized it. Yeah. But it stuck with me. I studied yeah. about it. I looked at the research. And I found that actually office is not the only place where work happens. Yeah. And there are viable alternatives to office for work to be delivered. And yeah. it sets many people free from the constraints of time and space. And yeah. it's a wonderful, almost like a revelation to me. I mean, yeah. experientially so, you know, not yeah. reading, but experiencing. Yeah, yeah. The second thing, I must give it credit that I, the fact that after years of industry work, that I am in an academic environment, yeah. and that there is a research ecosystem in which I work, and mm. there are a lot of other people who write, think, uh, you know, maybe this ecosystem really uh, further crystallize, help me crystallize the ideas because, you know, it matters. You, you work yeah. out where do you stay, what do you kind of what kind of ecosystem you're a part of. I think ISB brings a distinctive intellectual and scholarly climate. And mm. it is easier to kind of think through these issues there. And also yeah. the schedule, the flexibility, the workload, all that allows you to lead a more reflective life than the one I led as a corporate executive. So yeah. a combination of years of experience at work, handling the issues around work, which is what as an HR leader, I did through the, my life. You know, I looked at how people worked or did not work, yeah. how they struggled with work, 
and why yeah. managers thought people did work but people thought people worked and all the all the disparities and that i mean such this was you know understanding yeah. so that yeah. i was going with those ideas about how can organizations be different into the future mm. i was practicing some of them thinking about some of them but nothing crystallized nothing kind of come to a cohesive point you know yeah. till the yeah. pandemic happened and i must tell you a small detail that in the pandemic Uh, at ASB, we uh, set uh, uh, rolled out a series of research projects okay. about how do we bring back India. So it was called Jump Start India. Okay. Jump Start India, as in to say that if the pandemic cripples us, then yeah. how do we jump start again yeah. and bounce back? So yeah. different people they chose different themes, hmm. and hmm. I, from the background that I am. I'm, HR and organizational background, I chose the theme of remote work, mm, and, mm. and I said, "What could be the interface between remote work and India bouncing back?" Yeah, yeah. And then I got the support of a lot of MBAs. About fifty of them worked with me on ten different work streams. Nice. Uh, yeah, on various dimensions of what can create an ecosystem where yes. remote work could be transformational for this country. So oh, yeah. it is all those I think that can be brought me to this book. Right, right. So I mean, I think what a wonderful springboard to be able to think of this book. Um, yeah. You know, I, I know your theme. Your your book is shaped by the ideas of the demographic dividend that India has, the technology edge that India has. Do you want to share a bit more about that? Because you know, I think it's not about it's not about the book being about the future of work. It's about unleashing the human capital of Bharat, which is, which is really the eye catcher. So I'll come to that in a bit. But tell me a bit about the demographic and the technology edge that you're talking about. It's so new economy and it's so timely, and it's fabulous that you've made perhaps one of the earlier attempts of linking this to the future of work. Yeah. No, thank you. And they are linked, and you're very right, very perceptive about that. Uh, one is driving the other. <clears throat> so. Um, So the first one is, in some sense, in the order of that, is digitalization, mm. and uh, we now know. I mean, I don't have to one more time belabor the point. The digitalization is that point of time in history, which is mm. now a irreversible, yeah, and inevitable kind yeah. of a trend and a uh, kind of a aspect of our society now. It mm. will touch. It is already touching almost every aspect of human life. In every area, in every country, there cannot be anybody who will be outside the realm and influence of digital uh, digitalization. So, digitalization is manifesting itself in in some areas as robotization and automation and stuff like that. But mm. in many other areas, it is also manipulation, manipulating as actually changing almost the organization models yeah. and actually making organizations more digital, more platform based, and don't have to have the physical Infrastructure. You can have the world's biggest hotel chain without owning a hotel and call yourself Airbnb. And so yeah. it is a it's a different world now that we live in. And yeah. for me, who has seen the the physical world uh, yeah. into this digital world, both uh, as an eye opener and as an amazing uh, thing, almost like childlike curiosity. I have been watch pursuing all the trends of how you might actually run almost a factory. Uh, remotely, without having anybody there, how mm. you can have a digital twin in a very traditional place like Tata Steel and actually run the blast furnace from a distance? How mm. you can go uh, into a mine field with a robotic, uh, you know, whatever machine JCB, uh, mm. like a, you know, driving a um, video game, uh, mm. or you know, what you can do? How can uh, ICUs be run remotely and surgeries be performed? It, yeah. All this is happening. This is not some. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for some places it is distant future, but for many other places it is already arrived. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it is you that you can hail a driverless car in San Francisco. So oh, yeah. it is no more uh, science fiction. So, yeah. so the the fact that digitalization is touching how work is designed, how work is delivered, and how work is experienced. Yeah, all of the dimensions of it, you know. Is mm. something that I saw has tremendous influence in a country like India, which mm. is you know more 
um, in a way constrained by its large territory of different types of uh, regions, some very, very inaccessible. And it takes years and decades for us to kind of build complete infrastructure. So just imagine the ability of drones to deliver medicines into a, a remote village or uh, pesticides in a place. You know, these are all things that we must welcome. And yeah. these are things that will impact our lives. So it's not wonder that uh, there are youngsters who are saying, I will not do any job. I'll be just a YouTuber. Yeah. And these people who are completely non-English speaking, mm. non-urban, yeah. and completely rural Indians who are taking to uh, mobile phones and making oh, yeah. a living out of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and these yeah. are transformations that we should notice, we should acknowledge, and where deserving, we should celebrate so that we yeah. are able to redirect the society from its yeah. established notions of what is work, career, organization, etc., into yeah. the new opportunities. So that's, yeah. I thought, on one side, digitalization was happening. Hmm. The other side, the because it was happening at a time when there is a distinct demographic shift. So this yeah. demographic dividend has two meanings. You know, one is the fact that uh, we are large and we are too many and we therefore have many hands and uh, you know also mouths and also mm. have, you know brains uh, on yeah. the other hand that we are youthful i don't yeah. have everyone knows these statistics that for several decades now india will remain one of the youngest nations yeah. and that the fact that the youth are digital natives yeah that my son or grandson uh, um, granddaughter are all already far more. They're just living in the world of Insta yeah, yeah. and all that. And they are not done. For me, it is an effort. But for them, it's yes. just natural. And, yes. and that, that uh, digital natives uh, then interacting with digitalization. So what's happening? We must see it is like a mutually reinforcing phenomenon. Yeah. So youth wanting more digitalization, digitalization yeah. enabling the youth to want it more. So mm. it is, it's an amazing thing as to how we are uh, working along with technology and shaping our yeah. taste. And as our taste changing, technology is responding to it. Yeah. Yeah. So I want a, uh, you know, I'm halfway through the toast in my toaster and I want butter. I suddenly don't have butter. Today, I can think of blink it, and in five minutes, it will come to my home. And yeah. uh, therefore, did I need blink it first, or did I got blink it? Therefore, I got it. It's very difficult to determine. Yeah. I think both are happening simultaneously. My need and the facility are occurring together, and yeah. each is causing and triggering the other. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I think the medium, the medium to fulfill those ideas and those sort of desires is so obviously technology. So yeah. um, you know, so you say, you may say I have a desire or, or I have an idea or I have a wish, but we now have the the lamp, the Aladdin's lamp, to actually convert that. I mean, you know, I keep saying everything we thought was magic is what technology is actually it doing. Is happening, and at the same time, technology is constantly realizing that people need these new things. And they are yeah. showing the art of the possible. So they are yeah. saying, you didn't know that you can actually have a more immersive call. But I'm always saying yeah. is that this this Zoom call that we are doing, I yeah. think in 10 years' time, it will look like STD booths of the old years. I'm and, sure. And there will be more immersive ways in which we can come together. And, oh, yeah. and that is what we should be. And I'm very optimistic and enthusiastic about the possibilities oh, yeah. of technology. Yeah, there is no Absolutely. doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll come back to technology in a bit in terms of the opportunity of technology and the experience of technology and what that gap might really be. But before that, I wanted to talk about the, you know, you're saying that your trigger has really been the flexibilities that you experienced, um, you know, during the pandemic. And the fact that it was like feeling liberated in the sense that we didn't think or know it was possible to be productive like this. And to your point that you could scale up by while you're doing what it is that you're doing and you could um, basically, uh, you know, you could deliver to complex technologies, you could make changes, you could talk to teams, you could do everything that you're doing uh, inside an office. Um, you know, I just wanted to take you back a bit around and I think it's because we're in, in this you know, as much as we love the world 
of what it is that the book is allowing us in terms of being able to make intellectual connections. There is a reality of what you experience in a workplace. So I wanted your reaction on a whole host of organizations making uh, taking almost an about turn around flexibilities. And after we just celebrated it and said, we just discovered this great thing, um, you know, this whole pushback saying that, you know, we're just not getting the kind of productivity or discipline um, or retention that we want, the stickiness that we want for talent. So tell me a bit about how you, considering that you're upholding this and celebrating this as a major trigger for why it is that you needed to tell the story of your book, um, you know, how do you react to flexibilities being reversed? Yeah, no, I, I agree that there is a reversal. Hmm. But uh, below the media headlines and the large organizations, hmm. there is also a creeping growth of the acceptance of remote work. So hmm. each media headline that you hear that people are asked to come back, you will go deeper into it. You'll see that in many cases they're asked to come back for two days and hmm. not for all. Mm. Okay, so there is a implicit acceptance that mm. it is possible to be away for three days. Yeah. So that's the beginning. So let me if, let me explain to you. I think in a way it is a pity that in mm. today's age we are taking this long to learn the lessons that we could have easily learned and accelerated our uh, development and evolution. But mm. having said that, it is also a very natural phenomenon. So as mm. a part of the writing the book, I studied a lot about what I call the history of work. Mm. I mm. studied about how did work evolve? How did people try and work, struggle with this whole idea of work? And yeah. it, in summary, it appears that there have been always, it took centuries for us to shift from one work model to other. So mm. the cave to the hunting uh, and uh, gathering, hunting and gathering to agricultural rhythms, agricultural rhythm to industrial rhythms, industrial rhythms to computer age and cubicles are all not shifts that happened overnight. We mm. are just about three, four years from the pandemic. But yeah. when the industrial you know, industrialization happened, the classic farmer did find it very difficult to go get up exactly at a certain time and travel to a certain place called factory and work mm. for a certain number of hours under the supervision of somebody. I don't think the transition happened automatically. Yeah. It, 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 we do not stay on that his part of the history and we do not reflect on it. But mm. we must know that these transitions take time. They yeah. are uh, like long periods of historical shifts. So mm. the way I view it is that right now we are going through that struggle of yeah. holding on to habit mm. and experimenting with evidence. Hmm. Uh, so we are in, in the two worlds, you know, yeah. Habit yeah. and instincts are telling us that, okay, let's go back to the comfort of a place called office. So, and yeah. it's, it's not easy. So let me give you a little more into this. Hmm. So if you look at office, it's just about 300 years old. Okay. In the large, long millennia of human history, 300 hmm. years of nothing. It's just a small, yeah. small spot. How offices began was because in the British uh, king at that time wanted to count what properties were being brought back to, you know, what gems, jewels and rare things are being brought back by the sailors who were yeah. going all over the world. They created what were called counting houses. So okay. they, they actually took stock at the outside of the ship and the port if what was being brought. So that state exchequer didn't lose out on tax or on collections and all that. Okay. Soon, okay. soon files came about because okay. papers had to be put somewhere and then okay. files needed storehouses. So actually the first house offices were called counting houses. And okay. then because files came, desks came, because desks came, clerks came, clerks came, supervisors came. And then okay. the whole gene bank of what we today consider as office evolved okay. over the last 300 years. So much so that we have built a huge infrastructure and huge uh, ecosystem in, in making office almost as good as home. So for the youngster today, who's not yeah. in, a, in a city, uh, he could actually literally go. And we have deliberately made offices attractive like that with yeah. uh, gyms and massage chairs and showers and sleeping pods and gourmet yeah. food and, uh, you know, a, a pool table. Yeah. So you can get up in the morning, go to office 
and do everything that you did at home and then come back in the night just to sleep yeah uh, so that how we have honed the office so mm. i'm not surprised the new ideas of how might we build an ecosystem mm. for what to happen more remotely from non office locations what to right. happen anywhere is still mm. in the very early stages and yeah. with an ecosystem and what are the requirements we need a broadband internet we need uh, into universal access to that we need yeah. a little bit of rural infrastructure to improve uh, because mm. people get to live there with going to schools and going to hospitals we need companies to change their work models we need managers to learn not to expect people to be under their nose and be able to manage them more more by outcomes than by efforts mm. so every aspect of the organization has to change to be yeah. better use of this new opportunity yeah changes are difficult first of mm. all they're not realized they're not thought through carefully it is still mm. viewed as though we are doing a privilege discussion here that we are yeah. allowing people to work from yeah. home we are not yeah. seeing it as a business imperative yeah. we are seeing it as a as a kind of a something we are privilege giving to a section of people this is no more so it's a new normal it can be honed to full productivity so you made three points productivity discipline and retention hmm. there is no evidence hmm. that productivity falls under hmm. the right circumstances if you work remotely there is hmm. in fact the contrary there is research and evidence that productivity hmm. remains the same or improves hmm. uh, simply because people experience more autonomy they take to work more seriously hmm. discipline the definition of discipline has to undergo a change hmm. discipline not compliance mm. discipline not just confirmation to some blind rules discipline mm. has a more intrinsically guided desire to commit to deliver something that you mm. have promised to deliver mm. you need to move from this control command my mindset to yeah. Yeah. so yeah yeah and, and, and retention well depends on the uh, the reason for attrition is not just the format of work mm. there are many reasons the market oh, yeah. is growing opportunities are growing skills are changing people's notions about careers are changing and managers are lousy so if all of them come together retention how will retention be possible mm. it will be the same whether you come to the office or you work elsewhere so i mm. think our objections are alibis they're born out of years of habit it's mm. time to change mm. Mm. i'm just wondering as somebody who has uh spent most part of your career in the brick and mortar uh sort of world um do you still see merit in people physically meeting each other as well and to be able to have some of that stickiness which is very difficult to create online i think I we have a great sense of understanding and rapport because we both met each other so many times and we I know do, each other i do, I do. I do. And I think this is the yeah, first time that there would be equal comfort yeah i do i do i do yeah. i understand we are just exaggerating that need ah, okay. only the point i'm making is that mm. especially let's say if you are a new completely new employee to the organization mm. then for some time till you get fully acclimatized to the organization you mm. certainly need to go to a place where people you can observe people you can mm. see what happens mm. so to that extent some hybrid arrangements are required more careful onboarding is required and if you are more experienced the need to meet people physically will keep coming down as yeah. time goes but yeah. socializing is a human instinct hmm. and it is natural for us to socialize so here here is a point i want you to understand that actually without saying it officially we always use offices more to socialize than hmm. only to work hmm. Hmm. that is so true. True. yeah and and yet we are we are just confusing the two issues i think mm. offices as lounges cafes mm. and mm. hangout places should mm. continue mm. but offices as cubicles that slave you into work must mm. change mm. <laughs> that's the difference yeah uh, that is, yeah. yeah yeah would would you would you allude to the fact that if someone's competent and already knows the job i mean has some experience basically then they're better suited to be self directed because you know when you work on your own you do need that self directed orientation whereas if you're relatively at the first stages or early stages of your career or let's say you're in a very um sort of volatile environment in the kind of nature of work you're doing that the number of times 
you need to perhaps meet physically or work together for cohesiveness um, might just be a little higher. So I, I'm in short asking you, is it also circumstantial whether you work for a startup, whether there are too many variables in the environment, you don't have enough experience in what it is that you're doing? Would this also vary depending on that? I love your idea of the office being just a lounge or a coffee place or a meeting place with people. I think it's a beautiful idea. I'm just wondering yeah. whether we take some time to get there. No, we will get that time. But, but my point is, the uh, why we should recognize the need for people to be trained, mentored, and have the opportunity to observe more skilled people and learn from yeah. them. Yeah. We should not use them as reasons or alibis to perpetuate a regime where mm. your competence development depends on my generosity of allowing you to become competent. So mm. please understand, autonomy <laughs> autonomy has a beautiful function. It is self-propelling force. So mm. if I keep uh, hand-holding my young seven-year-old for in cycling, mm. uh, saying that left alone he will fall, mm. I will delay his ability to learn cycling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I completely agree so with this. Therefore, yeah. both are required. Can he be fully yeah. left alone? Sometimes he will fall. That is true. Yeah. But yeah. therefore, can I use it to just keep controlling him? No. Yeah. So this yeah. is what managers should know. Where is the line to draw? When to withdraw? Yeah. Are you investing in competence or are you investing in compliance? Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. one. Good. I, yeah. I think good point. And, and, and I think that this distinction between competence and compliance, so one being an alibi for the other, you know, I think it's an important area of a reflection and inquiry for for practically everyone. You know, I want to move this to, um, you know, the fascinating line in the title of your book, which is around um, unleashing the human capital of Bharat and, um, and, and try and, you know, draw this conversation towards Bharat and the opportunity of Bharat. And like I said, that I think what I found most... Um, interesting and and uh, sort of hopeful was the was the connection between future of work and the opportunity of um, unleashing the power of bharat so i want to take it to bharat and try and understand what parts of um, the future of work did you see manifest particularly in the context of how bharat is poised i know we just spoke about technology and the uh, demographics but tell me some more around this because you know we yeah. are talking about a very a complex populous country uh we're talking about you know you say any one thing it is always always a spectrum so it's so difficult to say there's one answer to this it's always so layered um and i'm saying that even if i just pick technology for instance um you know and we say that um and i see this even when i'm doing the immersion business immersion work with international companies and groups coming to india which is that on one hand you know you will see fascination for our fast tag program or our you know Aadhaar card I, unique identity program and there's just and i think what what is wondrous for everyone is the scale we are managing with this even if it's passport control on the airports it's easily one of the most efficient system for the quantum of people who are actually traveling so and at the same time, when you come and contrast this with organizations who do have resources to be able to start basically manifesting the future of work through technology within the organization, you'll still have groups of MBAs who've been hired from leading B schools coming back and saying that I've joined this large organization through the um, through my campus and we are asked to keep vouchers uh, for all our uh, induction through our induction programs. These vouchers will get processed once in six months. We are asked to put down the monies up front instead of giving us allowances to be able to do this. The general contention in the organization is that you already paid very well, so we don't need to give you an advance or anything. And plus, we will be feel free to reimburse this basically whenever able. Uh, and to imagine that we're still doing this with vouchers and we're still doing this with uh, having to keep all the invoices and collect them over a period of time to be able to get the money back. And it's shocking, especially as you're trying to bring in Gen Z into the workplace. So I know there are multitudes of so stories well, that I so mentioned. Well said, so well said. I mm -hmm. can't uh, agree more to you that some of our feudal bonded labor practices are mm -hmm. just getting more sophisticatedly remanifested through mm -hmm. things like uh, work now, pay later. So, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, voucher is just about a similar device. Yes. So yes. now, now my first thing I think, let me respond to this Bharat issue. So mm. first of all, I must clarify that Bharat to me, this Bharat India contrast to me, and mm. I don't want to be dragged into it. I'm yeah, yeah. Neutral. I have no idea of why there should be a political issue. I think Bharat is a a, a signaling expression to say there is a large realm of India, vast territory of India, a huge talent landscape of India, and a huge potential of India that is not getting mainstreamed. Hmm. Because we have been in more recent times focused on the urban centers, hmm. and all the Delhi's, Mumbai's, and are all hogging the attention. And we hmm. are forcing millions of people to migrate to find mere yeah. livelihood in these big yeah. cities. Therefore, we are doing double disservice. We are making the cities unlivable, congested, mm. uncommutable. Bangalore, imagine two hours of traffic anywhere you go. These are oh, yes. so much painful. At the same time, we are depriving the villagers from a self-sustained growth and emptying out the villages of young people. And you yes. can see the barren villages, the young are no more there in the village. Mm. And the old poor fellows are left without a hospital without a social health. I think we are doing a service to both. So mm. it's time to, uh, you know, balance this out. We must decongest the cities and we must develop the small towns. Oh, and yeah. it is not an easy, there is no silver bullet. I'm sure yeah. the government is thinking, policy makers are thinking but and doing many things, but it's nothing is enough. What yeah. I think is important is to recognize first that talent doesn't belong only to the cities yeah. and that actually you have to go to you know to 250 kilometers from Coimbatore into a small village or anywhere from Bombay to Nasik to Akola and then you will see that there is a lot of talent it is mm. India is in at least six to eight layers of towns mm. it's mm. not just the big Bombay and even oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's so many towns and each of them is bubbling with energy bubbling mm. with talent and it's a pity that we are unable to utilize them and reach them mm. why we are not able to reach because our work models are industrial era models yeah we have still kind of designed them to make an office so there is a line i uh, normally quote from my book which says how we work it determines how many of us can work mm. now, think mm. about it deeply yeah. If we work only in one way, then yeah. only a few people can work. So if work yeah. can go only to a city-bred MBA, then yeah. only city-bred MBAs will work. If yeah. work has to be only 9 to 7, then only those people who can afford to be 9 to 7 can yeah. work. If yeah. work has to be in the vicinity of a big city, you have to go to a BKC to work, then people in so Goregaon will find it hard. So we are excluding, there is a chapter in my book about human capital inclusion. We mm. are excluding uh, a lot of the human capital by making very restrictive mm. and very industrial era work models, which mm. by design is keep many people outside the labor market. Yeah. Today, you must know this, today, in today's times of India, I read with great delight a mm. news which says the government is coming with guidelines for improving flexible work options mm. so mm. that women participation in the labor force can improve. Mm. Mm. Finally, the government is recognizing yeah. Yeah. that the kind of work we do is not mm. suitable. There are many women who want to balance life very differently. Absolutely. Different priorities. So there yeah. is no reason why we should flog them to a place called office at Nine at nine o'clock and leave them at seven. They reach ten and then there's nothing they can do anymore. And yeah. it's not possible. You may give a crash, you may do what, but the flexibility of doing things. I have experimented during my work life. Uh, I had a program called the Special Hospital Executive, where we went to offer women. We were finding that not many people were joining the sales force of a pharma company. So we said to the women, "Why are you not joining?" They said, "This mm. office work hours don't suit us." So yeah. said, what kind of workouts you want? He says, 11 to 1 after my the child goes or 10 to 12 or something. And then again at 3 to 6 or something. I'll yeah. work if you want to pay me a little less. That's fine. But those are the hours during which I work. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So we said to you, does it really need 10 hours of running around? If yeah. you have, we created a, 
uh, post called a hospital executive. They went to hospitals to sell. It was predictable. Okay. There were hours. They, were, they went by appointments and they didn't have to do other things, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it is possible for employers to be imaginative about what yeah. point. If oh, yeah. they do that, they will be more inclusive. Yeah. And yeah. senior citizens, women, elderly people who cannot, and just sheer village people who cannot migrate. The pain mm -hmm. of migration is very mm -hmm. miserable. Very miserable. Yeah. yeah. And we've seen the you know reverse that happened during pandemic when thousands oh, yeah. of people, lakhs of people had to walk back home. We yeah. don't have scenes anymore. So we want to create that. So what is my point? My point is tap into Bharat for talent. Mm -hmm. Develop the rural towns. Yeah. Take work to people instead of bringing people to work. Mm. And find imaginative ways of doing it. Leverage technology where possible. Otherwise, take infrastructure. So Zoho, for example, as mm. a company, has gone and opened rural offices. Mm. And the quarter itself is in a rural town. Mm. So that's also another model. I'm only not saying everything has to be remote. I'm yeah. saying flexibility is the issue. Remote work yeah. Yeah. is one of the main menu of flexibility. Yeah. It's yeah. not the only thing. Flexibility yeah. is many things. You know, you ability yeah. to do things in your own time, in your own pace, in your own yeah. place, in your own choice, informed yeah. choices that yeah. are mutually agreed upon would oh, free yeah. up a lot of energy and a lot yeah. of time. That's yeah. how technology must be leveraged and work models must be reinvented to build an inclusive India, which will be then bringing Bharat to India. That's yeah. the point of the book. Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, can you uh, can you uh, sort of uh, expand on that a bit and maybe take one idea and talk about it or one story and talk about how do you how do you recast? How you how do you reinvent? How do you basically, uh, you know, challenge the status quo and, and get out of the the web or the or the traps of old habits? Because it requires some courage to do this. And I think yeah, everyone. There are already employers who are doing it. By the mm. way, for all the talk of return to office, the mm. major, many major IT companies below the radar, they do not admit, but mm. I have talked to them. I have met, I have personally met as well as interviewed, mm. believe me, close to a thousand plus people over the last three, four years mm. who are working from the smallest of towns in India already mm. for our major companies. They have not come back. Mm. And it is true that they are still working. It is true. I mm. can name you. I met a guy from Barhampur, for example, small mm. town between Odisha and Andhra. And yeah. he, he says that if my employer says that I have to go back to Bangalore, he has mm. to pay me an extra allowance because it's so mm. much harder to live in Bangalore than live in my own hometown and ask him yeah. to prove that I didn't do my work well. And mm. uh, so uh, I have interviewed people rural uh, when people go back to small towns multiplier effects happen mm. and they they go if they earn even 80 percent of their city salary all mm. that you see soon is around their house there is now a pizza hut around mm. their house there is now apartment complexes are coming saying two bedroom plus work from home room mm. you know these changes that are happening in the semi-urban india mm. are due to the fact that there are already people who mm. are no more in there. I, I used to have a person living in a, I mean, a tenant in my house in Mumbai. And uh, he suddenly said, I'm leaving. I said, why? Because he said, I don't have to be in Mumbai. I can be in Dehradun and work. That's my hometown. And he's mm. still there. He's there. There is his offices agreed. So this, mm. yes, if there are stories, major media, because it's so nice, sensational to say Amazon has asked everybody to come back. So yeah. the media is not the only way to look at. We should look below that. Yeah, already seeped in. Yeah. It is settling yeah. down. It will take time. Yeah. We don't yeah. create the infrastructure, it will not work. So, it's one. Mm. So, the, the other important things experiment wise, I'm telling you one mm. is that big companies uh, hiring consciously people in small towns mm. and saying that you don't have to come except mm. once in a while for an off site or, a, or some kind of a social get together or initial days of onboarding. The rest of the time, you can work remotely and we will redesign your work model and contract for it. But you mm. will not moonlight. <laughs> we yeah. fire you by new moonlighting. And if all that is done, one of the easiest ways to deploy inclusive uh, talent model management is through remote work. But the reverse mm. is also important. The mm. reverse is 
the city what what is one of what our our towns and small towns and villages what are they suffering they are mm. suffering from uh, talent in those towns in another way which is an experienced surgeon or a, a doctor or a specialist or a big teacher a professor so for example if i can uh, staying in hyderabad offer my classes to a lot of people in adilabad they don't have to come to isb Mm. And, and, mm. and is there a great proof that they would lose a lot? No, it is. It is very evident that the online education is as it is effective, very close to the, except some content areas and some learning areas. Most of the areas, it is possible to deliver a mm. productive learning outcome. So now, both the the specialists in the city can make their services available to small towns without mm. moving from the city yeah. and the small town people can make their services available to the big city and if mm. both of them don't work you can move to the small towns which mm. is also happening by the way so mm. just think about it infosys you heard the headlines that it companies are all asking return to office but mm. do you know that infosys is paying incentives for people to go to hubli and work okay all right yeah yeah. They, are, they have an official policy that if you okay. choose to work in Hubali, then okay. you will be paid more money. So okay. companies have begun to realize a, a public yeah. sector company like Sail hmm. has announced a work from home policy. Okay. And, and we don't read about all this. We read yeah. only the sensational side of our freedom is gone because that makes sense. That makes media. Yeah. Sense. But the, yeah. the employers are also realizing that it is possible to harness the power of you know geographic agnosticity as i call it yeah yeah kind of talent tap talent elsewhere but they are in all early stages in green yeah, yeah of course of and course i think they need to be they need to be broadcasted in the early stages just to encourage more people to snap out of the you know the old habits or uh, you know the status quo bias the countries are the ones to go by so during yeah. the pandemic the first time i i opened hmm. is Right in 2021, hmm. I read about an experiment called Tulsa Remote in America. Tulsa okay. could be a town as big as Nasik or something like that. I don't know exactly. Okay. Something very small town. Okay. And it is in the state of Oklahoma. Okay. What does the mayor do? Mayor sees an opportunity in the pandemic and says, like, if you are in San Francisco or Chicago or Manhattan, then if you come and work in Tulsa, I'll give you an incentive. I'll give you $10,000 to start with. Then I'll okay. give you professional electricity. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. So he invited people for, so that his town can develop. Hmm. So imagine the, the mayor of Jaipur or some town, yeah. you know, Jod, Jodhpur does this in India. Yeah. yeah. We'll have a different uh, world. I'm sure there are people who yeah. want to go to Jodhpur and work, you know. Oh, and yeah. People create that. So Japan, for example, has huge penalties if you move to any of the big cities of Tokyo, etc. Mm. And it has reverse incentives for people to go uh, to outside the cities. So mm. it is a trend in the world. The yeah. countries, there are at least 30 countries who offer you digital nomad visas. Mm. Particularly mm. in Eastern Europe countries, you can go and work there and get a visa for the fact that you can work from that country. Mm. So mm. there are already models that yeah. just based in the din of media headlines, they are getting lost. We yeah. need to, as you said, we need to do the broadcasting yeah. 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 yeah 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 absolutely so um you know i think this is just such a fabulous conversation and you're already giving me so many ideas for what kind of um sort of themes can your commune work on can the community work on and i think these are our excellent even if they're early days i think they're excellent areas of work particularly for professionals in the human resources and the change management space to be able to do more work in this in this arena and they could be the very significant broadcasters and influencers for this um sort of reverse migration that you're uh, sort of alluding to you know your your book uh, talks about the invaluable opportunity of india in terms of uh, demographics and you know i'm tempted to to uh, to tell you something i'm sure you already know which is that um, you're now seeing um, Gen X, uh, you know, whatever whatever is left of Gen X in top leadership positions. A lot of the millennials or the early millennials taking over a lot of those leadership positions now. And uh, very significantly, most organizations have 70% of their 
headcount is is both the millennials and the younger millennials and the Gen Zs. Um, they are flummoxed, to say the least, on how to be able to get their arms around uh, the lens or the worldview of particularly the Gen Zs who are coming into the organization. I wanted your view, and particularly because you've written a book on the future of work, what would you leave the viewers with in terms of being able to manage multi-generations at work? Start with, it has to be a deep awareness. We cannot paint the whole organization with one brush. There are no more one-size-fits-all policies. And yeah. Generations are true. Generational cohorts are true. Their needs are true. So it is not necessary only to celebrate the Gen Z. We have to also uh, be careful about the Gen X and the boomer who are still around a little bit and also the senior citizens. India, if India will have 70% people below 30, it will have 80%, 30% people above whatever number. And that is not a small number either. Yeah. So intergenerational uh, workforce management has to be a very central matter of concern and strategy in organizations. Organizations must not treat everybody alike. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. Second one is obviously the Gen Zs and the, if not Gen Alpha, which will follow now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they will stare at you more than others, more demandingly than others. And for them, we have to adjust, we have to change. The best way to do that, surprisingly, is to look back at our home and our families. Mm. Instead of thinking this as a workforce issue, we must think it as a social demographic issue. Yes. So yes, if I would encourage Gen X to look at how he sees his or her child growing. Mm. What, how do you treat them? They are no more afraid of you. They don't mm. listen to you because you are the parent or you have mm. the title called vice president or parent. You yeah. are, or they don't uh, sort of, they ask for everything. They ask for explanation. They ask freedom. And they, they there is autonomy that's clearly being demanded. And they are digital natives. And they need instant gratification. They are nurtured it that you are spoiling or you are bringing them up in that spirit. How yeah. can you have your own children suddenly change when they come to the office? Yeah. yeah. The way so, to raise them in the yeah. home is the way yeah. you have to raise them in the office. Yeah. You can't have an yeah. old command control style of bossism that yeah. didn't apply at home, at the workplace. So two things. Intergenerational management is a new priority for organization management, not just HR management. Yeah. Leaders of organizations have to understand yeah. that. Two is Gen Zs will stare us more more than others and for them the hotline is flexibility autonomy these are mm. the two big big things for them right right so well said and thank you i absolutely allude to the idea that whoever you're meeting at work in gen z are the kids you're raising at home so yeah i mean it's basically not so difficult to get them yeah they're not not people who've just emerged from nowhere these are the people we are exactly. raising yes <laughs> yeah. yes Yes. So I'm going to come to the last question, and I wish we could have continued with this absolutely delightful conversation. But I have to ask you this. What advice do you have for anyone who's going to, who has a book inside them and, and they feel the need to write one? Um, what is the advice you'd like to give them with your own experience having put this book together? It's always a mega project. And so, um, you know, I'm sure, and particularly because it's your first one, it would have been, uh, you know, particularly a labor of love. And uh, what were your own reflections and learnings through this entire journey of putting the book together? Because it's always, um, you know, the person who's put the book together has learned the most because you basically had the opportunities for research, conversations. There's so much that's gone behind it, including your very stellar career of so many years. So tell our viewers a bit about what are the, the top pieces on if you want to write a book and what are your top two or three learnings from having put the book together? Let me put that in a perspective. Mm. There are books and there are books. Yeah. And all of them don't have to follow the same formula. Of course. If you want to write a distinctive book, mm. a book that makes a unique or a distinctive or a compelling point of view, mm. then it needs a different level of preparation. Mm. If you want to just rehash what you have read here and there and just mm. make it like seven ways to ask for a raise type of books, which the you yeah. know the western world is very familiar with these cookie cutter manual type self-help books are easy relatively easy to write but yeah. there's enough information and sometimes i'm worried that chat gpt will write it better than you do yeah. so 
and so there is no advice for such aspiring writers who just want yeah. to join the crowd of writing yeah for the sake of having i am a writer right but yeah. please if you want to be a distinctive writer then i guess you should wait if it takes years so be it you should wait for your uh, that distinct idea that you want to really you must have a compelling idea you must mm. have a case you have something to say that you believe will make a difference or has some there is a reason why somebody should read you the, yeah. and you have to have that for that it is a matter of a lot of retro, introspection a lot of reflection it's not about rushing so the techniques of do hard work get up five in the morning every day said you will have two hours of writing those are not the things i want to leave with my you know viewers my point is that get in touch with your mind and heart find out what is your voice where are you have a compelling idea what is distinctive it will mm. remain in the beginning in a very seed seed like form embryonic mm. then try to uh, you know sort out from different seeds the one which you want to pursue and mm. then invest in it investigate research read document talk to people test ideas and have the discipline of writing and revising and writing and revising find a good publisher and convince them that your book is worth publishing and stay with your ideas for as long as you can and of course change as time comes by so i think it's a long process and a journey but the difference is are you just writing a book or writing the book yeah yeah okay good point good point so um i think um, you know with that uh, you know i'm going to try and bring our conversation to a closure only with a promise that we will bring you in on future your commune uh, platforms and i hope you will help us in that journey as you have in the past it will be a pleasure and um, thank you so much dr chandra this has been such an honor and a pleasure privilege to talk to you uh, today and i think this is going to be such a wonderful um conversation to leave behind with these so many gems that you've actually offered uh, people through this so thank you once again for your time and for everything that you've shared here today and of course we'll keep the conversation going so thank you, thank you dr chandra thank you.